Good morning, everybody. How are you? We hope this finds you well. We're thrilled to have so many people with us from all over, from Peace River we see, from Alberta, from Penticton, uh, Dauphin, Manitoba. It's so lovely to see you, James. Um, yeah, and Vancouver and all over the place. So really a warm welcome. Nice to see you, Manny, as well. A warm welcome to you. So it is our great pleasure to introduce you our, our session today, Peer Support That Fosters Recovery. So we know that peer support is dear to many people's hearts um, as administrators, researchers, clinicians, people receiving services, family members. This is such a critical part of what we do and it is such a, a, a treat to have uh, Debbie Sasula with us today who's going to speak uh, a little bit about the guidelines. So thank you, Debbie, for being with us. We really appreciate uh, the opportunity to hear from you. Um, so your advanced team, as you know, uh, start with Jordan Clark, our technology support person, uh, Dr. John Higginbottom, big thank you to him for uh, being the founder of PSR programs at Douglas College and really a strong leader with advanced practice in British Columbia and with psychosocial rehabilitation all over the country. So we are really grateful to John's vision and mission uh, to bring recovery-oriented PSR practice to uh, to our clinical world. So thank you for such a focus on the evidence and on dissemination of that knowledge. Thank you, John. To Matthew, our wonderful support, uh, continued support person. Uh, he helps us with, you know, technology and wonderful moderator. And without uh, Matthew, we would not be as um, professional looking as we are. So we're very grateful to Matthew for his, his support and his skills and his passion for this work. So thank you, Matthew and you'll see myself, Regina. You know that the uh, BC Advanced Practice is funded by the Ministry of Health, provides leadership, education, and guidance to the mental health field to help develop and put effective evidence-based psychosocial rehabilitation practices into place. That's what we plan to do. So I'm sure that you've visited the psyrehab.ca website, because that's how you got here. But just a reminder of our archive sessions, uh, some really high quality information there. Uh, we've really focused recently on a session on employment. Um, and really, our aim with the Ministry of Health work is to disseminate uh, best practices in all areas. So we're very grateful. Thank you, Matt, for posting that. We're also deeply appreciative to our instructors for the support. Please know that many people do this work pro bono, so it's off the side of their desk and in their work, busy work, work days. And we ask them to take on this whole technology piece. And many people just do that with grace and style. Uh, and we are deeply grateful for that expertise and for their contribution to evidence-based practices, um, not only in British Columbia, because we see there are people from other regions in Canada. So a big thank you uh, to our to our uh, presenters as well. Um, you know that our purpose is really to transfer that evidence-based knowledge, provide expert clinician consultation. So we've had the great privilege of working with different organizations in British Columbia. Um, so we're very grateful for that work. And we hope that that's a, contribute, a contribution to practice and thinking and policy and processes around recovery-oriented PSR. Our goal also is to provide training and education events such as this, develop website resources, and finally, to support the Provincial Advisory Committee and the community of PSR practice in general. And that is you. So a big, uh, a big thanks to you. Um, just a note, really, about our evaluation and an appeal to you. Please let us know what works for you. Please let us know what doesn't work. Please let us know if there are areas that you'd like to hear more about. If you are interested in presenting, we would love to hear from you. Um, we, so we just the more feedback that you give us, the better we hope that we will be. Uh, so it just your feedback helps us, as we say, get that clearer picture uh, of the implementation in community practice of evidence-based practices. Um, and you'll know that eva evaluation, survey, and certificates of attendance are emailed to registered attendants uh, shortly after the session. So that's our goal as well. And so now it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Debbie Sisula. Before I do that, however, I am just going to take a moment to highlight um, some key happenings that are happening in our country and in our province in the next little while, starting with the peer conference. And Debbie, who you'll hear from, is also a presenter at that conference. I understand that it's sold out, that there are over 400 delegates. But I think just as part of this work today, knowing that that's happening, 
hopefully you're one of those lucky people uh, who have registered uh, and hopefully we'll hear other information in terms of how they disseminate that information but I understand that it's April 27 to 29 in Toronto and uh, if you have more questions about that I'm sure Debbie will be happy to answer that during the presentation. Um, um, do want to just alert you that our PSR registration, PSR Canada registration is open. So that's a conference in Thunder Bay, happy and sunny Thunder Bay in June, from June 20 to 22. We would really love to see you there. In truth, we need your support. You'll also probably know that that's the time that we're going to announce our first registration for Canadian recovery-oriented psychosocial rehabilitation practitioners. So it really would be good to have you there as part of this uh, wave of change um, and hopefully engaging you as we go forward with registration for Canada. So that's a very, very exciting uh, opportunity for us as PSR Canada and hopefully for you as PSR clinicians, administrators and researchers people receiving services and family members. And you'll be pleased to know that our key speaker is uh, Janice Tandora, um, whose work we've really tried to highlight on our PSR advanced practice. I also understand that she's a key speaker for the peer conference as well. Um, so if you haven't signed up for the peer conference, here's another opportunity to see Dr. Tandora at our PSR conference. Um, and finally, just to highlight the work of the Mental Health Commission, I'm sure many of you are um, engaged with their webinars, but just to give you a um, heads up that their next webinar is on April 21. Uh, so the call for registration for that is out. If you don't have it, we will provide it for you. But we're looking forward to hearing from a gentleman, uh, Brian McKinnon, and also our much loved um, PSR representative, Fiona Wilson. Uh, from Ontario, who's somebody um, who's just a, a key leader in the peer, wor peer world as well. So she will speak about um, recovery as being personal in terms of the Mental Health Commission guidelines. And then in May, um, uh, Catherine Stewart from Psychosocial Rehabilitation and myself will speak about recovery in context, and that date will be announced very shortly. So just to keep you up to date with what's happening in the PSR and recovery world across the country, uh, that is part of what we try to do. So hopefully some of that information is helpful. And with that, a great joy to introduce you to Debbie Sasula, who is um, here with me on my left-hand side. Debbie, you may have met, and I know many of you uh, know her, uh, but just to give you a little bit of background for those of you who might not know her, uh, Debbie comes with a master's from Royal Roads University. Big shout out to her for that. Uh, also, uh, as a graduate from that program as well, in terms of leadership and healthcare, uh, we know that that program has, has much, much to offer uh, PSR practitioners. Uh, she's also, um, um, help me, RTS stands for? Reality Therapy Certified. Our Reality ther Therapy Certified. And the last letter stands for? Certified Peer Supporter. Cer certified Peer Supporter, and that makes sense. <laughs> uh, so she's a peer support and accreditation uh, from Peer Support and Accreditation Canada. So uh, Debbie is one of many people who worked on the uh, guidelines that are posted on the Mental Health Commission website. Uh, and she has 20 years of involvement in peer support uh, programs that range from peer support worker, she's been a researcher, developer, and coordinator of programs. Uh, a huge part of her legacy as well, I think, is the curriculum development part and the trainer. Uh, so she's left us with much information and manuals and information around uh, how to help uh, train and how to promote that training within different organizations. And she is currently the chair of the Peer Support Accreditation and Certificate uh, of Canada. So um, she's, she's chairperson of that committee. So we really have a, an amazing expert with us today. So with that in mind, I'm going to pass you over to Debbie. And uh, uh, we welcome you, Debbie. So just give us a second to get organized. And with that. We're just going to get the camera up and running and just start sharing. Uh, Welcome, and... everyone. So, here we are today. I just want to acknowledge the authors of 
the guidelines, which are Kim Sunderland and Wendy Mishkin. And I did ask if Wendy could be with us today, and she could not. So I'm here to present on the guidelines for the practice and training of peer support. So what are we going to do today? We're going to look at what the guidelines are and how the guidelines can help you. The guidelines are divided into two parts. Part one are the guidelines for the practice of peer support, and part two are the guidelines for the training of peer support. For peer supporters, they are a roadmap for personal development, and for administrators, they are a set of guidelines to develop or enhance peer support programs. The guidelines do support changing direction, changing lives, which is the mental health strategy for Canada developed by the Mental Health Commission of Canada and are meant to be consistent with its goals for achieving the best possible mental health and well-being for everyone. So that's a good start. So before we begin this journey, let's define peer support and recovery. So I'd like to open this now up to comments from you when you hear what is peer support, what comes to your mind? I'll give you a few seconds to type some words in. Individual lived experience. Citizens with lived experience, people with lived experience helping others in recovery journey. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate your assistance in that and what peer support is to us. So let's read what our definition is. Knowledge, shared knowledge and understanding from peers, friends, loved ones, shared experience or understanding. Thank you so much. What is peer support? A supportive relationship between people who have lived experience in common. And that's exactly what you guys have said. Thank you for that. Peer support works. Peer support is effective. People with lived experience of mental health conditions can offer huge benefits to each other. According to Making the Case for Peer Support Report, the development of personal resourcefulness and self-belief, which is the foundation of peer support, can not only improve people's lives, but can also reduce the use of formal mental health, medical, and social services. That's huge, and that could be a huge save cut, cost cutting for us all. So there's really nothing new about peer support. Community organizations have been offering peer support to family members and those with personal lived experience for decades. It is fairly new, however, that clinical sites workplaces and governments are taking notice of the value of this empathetic and holistic support and are attempting to de determine how to best incorporate it into their systems. So that's, we wanted to set the stage with peer support. Now I have another question for you, which I'll open it up for comments from you. What is recovery? We'll give you a few seconds to jot down some ideas. What is recovery? Optimal resiliency and ongoing hope, excellent. Personal work of healing. Process of getting your life back. Unique and different for each individual, for each person. Achieving full potential, potential purpose and personal journey. You're going so great, is a journey. Being able to come to terms with what's each one situation. Excellent, you guys. Thank you so, so much. Individual journey, hope, meaningful life, learning how to best live with one's life with, despite barriers. Thank you so, so much.
So what is recovery? Recovery focuses on people recovering a quality of life in their community while striving to achieve their full potential. It's a process through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. It's interesting, we've got potential mentioned twice here. So what is recovery? A sense of hope for the future rather than hopelessness, allowing peer support workers to be beacons of hope for others. A sense of mastery over one's life that includes self-care and resiliency strategies. A self-awareness that allows a person to know when stressors or stress levels are reaching an unhealthy level. A confident and empowered sense of self that contributes to quality of life. A readiness to share aspects of one's lived experience in a manner that is helpful and keeps the focus on the peer's experience. So we've set the stage, what is peer support and what is recovery? Now let's stop for a moment and see what stage is your peer support program at. I'm going to ask four questions and you will just think to yourself of where you are at in your peer support program. First of all, are you thinking about starting a peer support program but haven't taken action yet? Secondly, are you in the early stages of starting a peer support program and have taken some action? Thirdly, have you already started a peer support program? And lastly, have you been running a peer support program for some time and would like to improve it? So think about where you are at with your peer support program or where you want to be. And we'll go on with the journey. So the Mental Health Commission of Canada acts as a catalyst for improving the mental health system and changing the attitudes and behaviors of Canadians around mental health issues. The Changing Directions, Changing Lives strategy suggests that Canada's mental health care system would benefit from quote, shifting policies and practices toward recovery and well-being for people of all ages living with mental health problems and illnesses and their families, end of quote. So just to give you some background of where the guidelines came about, in September of 2012, Health Commission of Canada released Making the Case for Peer Support, which is a report based on a vast literature review, as well as input from more than 600 people across Canada in face-to-face -face consultations, and another 220 people through written and online surveys. The recommendations of this report included a call for the creation of various set of guidelines to support the development of peer support within Canada. Now in 2010, the Mental Health Commission of Canada also launched the Peer Project to learn from the experience of peer supporters across Canada and to promote peer support as an essential com component of mental health services. These guidelines are an outcome of that project. The peer project hosted face-to-face -face consultations with peer supporters in seven Canadian cities and one focus group with clinicians between August and December of 2010. An online survey was then sent to more than 300 people who expressed an interest in the project and their responses validated what had been noted during the consultations. In the summer of 2010, the peer project asked more than 300 participants to recommend an experienced and respected peer to represent Canada's 10 provinces and three territories. For British Columbia, it was myself and Patrick Raymond that have been on the peer project. As a result, a group was selected to engage in a more detailed consultation and leadership. This peer support leadership group consisted of 12 people from 10 provinces and territories, and other individuals were invited as advisors due to their own peer support expertise. 
So the training guidelines, which is what we're going to go through today, were developed in consultation with a working group of experienced peer support trainers from across Canada who shared experiential insights. The content of these two guidelines grew out of the expertise gained from the face-to-face -face consultations and the online survey and members of, members of the peer support leadership group reviewed and enhanced these guidelines throughout their development. These guidelines are focused on peer support of a formalized nature, meaning that the peer support worker is intentional about providing support. It is more than just two friends providing mutual support, but rather one person has prepared to become a peer supporter. They have taken the time to learn more about the principles of peer support and possibly gone through training to enhance their natural skills in areas such as empathic communication, respecting boundaries, and honoring self-determination and empowering the peer. Lived experience is vital and probably the most important component of peer support. But for formalized peer support, the peer supporter also needs to be on a path of recovery to do this work. Recovery focuses on people recovering a quality of life in their community while striving to achieve their full potential. Peer support can be provided in both group and one-on-one -on -one relationships and can take place in community groups, clinical settings, and workplaces. Regardless of its setting, peer support is considered to have value either on its own or as a complement to clinical care. For family members, the hope is not only for their loved one, but of equal importance, it is also for their own recovery towards health, well-being, quality of life, and resilience. So as you can see from the diagram on the slide, the various types of peer support are often described as following falling along a spectrum ranging from informal support among acquaintances to formal peer support within a structured organizational setting. Friendship and clinical care are specified at either end of the spectrum. The range of peer support options begins with informal peer support when acquaintances notice the similarity of lived experience and therefore listen and support each other. This type of interaction is more focused than a typical friendship may be. And you'll notice at the other end of the spectrum is peer support within a structured clinical setting in which there may be a program where peer supporters make a connection with peers on similarity of lived experience and offer the opportunity for a supportive, empowering relationship. So these guidelines are intended for the type of peer support that falls at the more formal end of the spectrum. Examples include clinical organizations, community organizations, and workplaces. The values, principles of practice, and skills and abilities of peer supporters apply to all types of peer support and all types of organizations that provide peer support. Are you guys with me so far? I'm gonna presume that's a yes. Yes, mm -hmm. we all say yes. <laughs> We're gonna now get into the practice of peer support in more depth. And before we go on, are there any comments or questions? Sounds good. Okay, we'll move on. These guiding values are designed to embody the main pillars of peer support and inform the code of conduct and principles of practice. We're now gonna pause for a moment and you're going to identify which of these values you resonate with both. You'll see the list of them there in the cloud and Matt is gonna put the poll forward and you can vote on which one you resonate with most.
Não. Everyone else can see it, but you can't see it. Um, so our results show that 38%, 13 respondents, find hope and recovery to be the value they resonate with most. Uh, 8.57 with self-determination, 11 with empathic and equal relationships, and 23 with dignity, respect, and social inclusion. Integrity, authenticity, and trust, 17% of participants today. And health and wellness is 5.7. Hmm. Hi, back. Thank you so much. That was very enlightening and something to think about as we go through the different what the definitions of the guiding values are. The reason I didn't do that first is because I wanted you to, off the top of your head, from your heart, come out with what resonated with you most. So we'll go through them now. Hope and recovery acknowledging is acknowledging the power of hope and the positive impact that comes from a recovery approach. Self-determination is having faith that each person intrinsically knows which path towards recovery is most suitable for them and their needs noting that it is the peer's choice whether to become involved in a peer support relationship. Empathic and equal relationships is not noting that the peer support relationship and all involved can benefit from the reciprocity and better understanding that comes from a similar lived experience. Dignity, respect and social inclusion is acknowledging the intrinsic worth of all individuals, whatever their background, preferences, or situation. Integrity, authenticity, and trust is noting that confidentiality, reliability, and ethical behavior are honored in each and every interaction. Health and wellness is acknowledging all aspects of a healthy and full life, and lifelong learning and personal growth is acknowledging the value of learning changing and developing new perspectives for all individuals. So these are the values that guide the, the guidelines. The making the case, here's an interesting point now. The making the case for peer support report notes that many peer supporters, quote, are afraid that peer support values will be destroyed if peer support becomes too professionalized. On the other hand, People recognized that peer support needs to grow and become more standardized with now recognized trained standards that can be adapted at that provincial level. End of quote. I'd like to pause here for a second and get your thoughts on that comment. I'll give you a few seconds to type in a few words. Thank you.
So back to the values. Excellent. Absolutely, they empower the mentee. Absolutely. That's part of determination. We empower the individuals to be self determined. Respect is very important. Done properly, professionalism will not change the relationship with peers. Mm -hmm. Journeying together. The professional team to give their perspective and be an example to other professionals. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. We'll give you a few seconds to finish typing and then we'll move on. So I don't want to cut anyone off. Empathetic, respectful, equal relationships. Back to our values, thank you. Perfect. The quality that a professional without lived experience cannot, yes, so true. The one thing that makes peer support unique above all other professions is that we do have that lived experience. Thank you for that. We know the kinds of evaluation tools work well and others that are not helpful at all. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And we'll now move on. As with any role, it is possible that over time, the peer support being offered may slip into a type of interaction that no longer honors the original intent. This is one reason that these guidelines have been created with guiding values. And I really appreciate that you've been really honed in on the values. Thank you for that. They may be used as a checkpoint to remind and encourage all members of the peer support program of the critical elements that must be honored. Principles of practice. They flow from the guiding values and further define the intent of the support being provided. They embody the character of the relationship and the philosophy of peer support work. The principles of practice are written from the perspective of the peer supporter, but can also direct practice or program or an organization. These principles guide and form program administrators in policy decisions. I'm now going through the principles of practice just to tell just to read through them what they are for you. So first of all, recognize the importance of an individual approach to recovery, respect where each individual happens to be in their own journey of recovery, and recognize that the goals, personal values, beliefs, and chosen path of the peer may not be the same as their own. Honor and in self-determination by working with the peer to co-create and explore options rather than simply provide direction and empower the peer to take steps forward on their own rather than helping by doing it for them. Interact in a manner that keeps the focus on the peer rather than on themselves and maintain a peer relationship that is open and flexible, making themselves available as necessary to a reasonable extent. Use recovery-based language and interact in a manner that focuses on the peer's journey to a more hopeful, healthy, and full life, rather than on focusing on symptoms 
diagnoses, and or an objective set by someone other than the peer. Share aspects of their lived experience in a manner helpful to the peer, demonstrating compassionate understanding, prior, monitor their own well-being, their own needs for the sake of their mental health, recognizing the need for help, personal growth, and resiliency when working as a peer support worker. Use interpersonal communication skills and strategies to assist in the development of an open, honest, non-judgmental relationship that validates the peer's feelings and perceptions in a manner that cultivates trust and openness. Empower peers as they explore possibilities and find their path towards a healthier and happier outcome with the eventual objective of encouraging disengagement from the peer support relationship when the time is right for the peer. Respect the various positive interventions that can play a role in promoting recovery. We have five more. Respect professional boundaries of all involved when exploring with the peer how they might interact with these other professionals when questions or concerns arise. Collaborate with community partners, service providers, and other stakeholders and facilitate connections and refer peers to other resources when appropriate. No personal limits, especially in relation to dealing with crises, and call for assistance in a collaborative manner when appropriate. Maintain high ethics and personal boundaries in relationship to gift giving, inappropriate relationships with peers, such as romantic or sexual intimacy, and or other interactions or activities that may result in harm to the peer or to the image of peer support. And lastly, Participate in continuing education and personal development to learn or enhance skills and strategies that will assist in their peer support work. So who here thinks that these principles of practice should fall not just across the lane for peer support, but for all professions? Got some yeses coming up, got some noes. The document I'm reading from are the guidelines for the practice and training of peer support. And at the end of this seminar, or at the end of this webinar, I will tell you where to get the guidelines and you can download them. Yes, yes, I see lots of yeses, exactly. Okay, we'll move on. Thank you so much. I believe their principles can be generalized, absolutely. Thank you so much. For a peer support, lived experience of mental health condition, either personally or in relation to a family member or loved one, is a fundamental requirement. The peer support relationship is based on the connection and understanding that comes from having experienced a similar challenge. Peer support is focused on striving for recovery rather than on the specific illness or symptoms. Therefore, the peers do not necessarily need to share the same diagnosis, but rather will find common ground in the challenges and issues that may accompany the mental health condition, such as stigma, loss of career or family, and or loss of independence and hope. And a common theme with mental health conditions and challenges are loss. Loss is a really common theme. An equally important aspect of lived experience is the degree of recovery and readiness of the peer supporter. The peer supporter will have lived through not only ill health and the issues that accompany it, but also a transition towards hopefulness and onto a path of recovery. And recovery is a dynamic process, therefore a peer supporter is said to be on a path of recovery and considered to be far enough along on that path when they have an ability to detect when they are in need of a health break. Okay, I want to pause here for a second and get your comments on that. I'll read the sentence again. Recovery is a dynamic process. Therefore, a peer supporter is said to be on a path of recovery and considered to be far enough along on that path 
when they have an ability to detect when they are in need of a health break. How important is that? For peer support in general. Absolutely essential, very, so very important. So not only is lived experience important, but also to identify where one is in their journey of recovery and to be far along, far enough along on their journey of recovery that they know when to take a health break. Self-care, very, very important. Thank you so much, you guys. Peer supporters will demonstrate innate abilities and acquired skills that make them suitable for peer support of this more formal nature in the areas as shown here. Yes, great modeling of self-care, absolutely. Okay, so now I have another question for you. Which of those skills or innate abilities do you think is most important? Matt will do a poll on that. Uh, and I'll just share those results. Everyone can see them now, I think, but uh, it looks like a large group of folks think lived experience is one of the most important innate abilities and acquired skills. That um, interpersonal communication also ranks very highly at 33% of the votes. And then there's a sort of an even division between critical thinking, teamwork and collaboration, and ethics and reliability. So very interesting results. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll go over these briefly. So lived experience, the primary personal attribute necessary to provide quality peer support is lived experience, experience with a mental health challenge or illness, either personally or through a loved one, accompanied by the experience of finding a path of recovery. Interpersonal communication is critical to building open, honest, non-judgmental mental and trusting peer relationships. Critical thinking is used when a peer support worker engages a peer and tries to understand as clearly as possible the issue that is being discussed. This may include working with a peer to uncover other possible underlying issues when and if the peer is ready to do so. Teamwork and collaboration is shown when a peer support worker works with a peer to explore the potential benefits of connecting with other community and clinical options. It also includes respecting the limits and boundaries of the peer support role. Peer support workers understand the benefits that can come from collaborating with others and the resourcefulness and good judgment while doing so. Personal integrity and an authentic Compassion for the peer will ensure that the relationship is grounded in ethical and trustworthy attitudes and actions, including an unwavering support of the personal growth of the peer. And again, I'm sure you see across the board how these skills 
abilities and personal attributes are important for all professions. Knowledge and training. Peer supporters should be encouraged to gain knowledge and further skills when opportunities are available. This may mean introductory training and ongoing learning and skills development throughout the duration of being a peer supporter. An introductory peer support knowledge and training session can assimilate the skills, abilities, and personal attributes identified in these guidelines. Knowledge and skill development. These are important components to consider. Knowledge is about learning the concepts of re resilience, self determination, and emotional well being that will inform an ability to support peers. In addition, learning the key concepts related to building supportive relationships and interpersonal communication will assist in skill development. Being aware of local support systems will also better prepare peer supporters for their role. Skill development is about the development of skills in areas such as interpersonal communication, supporting change, collaboration, and critical thinking, and is the ultimate objective of the training. Community of practice. Ongoing personal development will occur over time as a peer supporter strives to improve and learn from all peer interactions. However, there is a risk of stagnation, burnout, and or straying from the authenticity of peer support. Peer supporters working somewhat independently over time, possibly within challenging environments, may lose sight of some of the critical characteristics of peer support such as self-determination, non-judgmental empathy, and recovery-oriented hopefulness. It is for this reason that maintaining a connection with the community of practice is recommended. Even though peer support is becoming widely known and more accessible, there are still many regions without formal peer support programs and many groups of people who are unaware of or unable to connect with the peer supporter. These guidelines wish to highlight the challenge of accessibility for the purpose of encouraging decision makers, peer support managers, and peer supporters to determine, this is a hard word, determinedly, to say, determinedly, yeah, yeah. determinedly and creatively to overcome accessibility issues wherever possible. So in other words, to be determined in doing that. That's a better way for me to say it so I don't get tongue twied So before we go on to part two of the guidelines, are there any comments or questions? I'll give you a few seconds to make any comments or questions. Following me so far? Yep, good, good, good to hear, okay. So we're just going to pause for a sip of water. Good Vancouver water. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to part two, peer support training. A self-aware training participant will already instinctively know the value of hope, recovery, empathy, and self-determination as a result of their lived experience. But one purpose of training is to better understand the impact on their peers of supporting these principles. 
Peer support training will enhance the understanding and skill development of these and many other principles. Two types of lived experience. The cat just walked by. <laughs> Can we show you the cat? See the cat? There you go. Just had to show you show you the love of my life, cats. Okay, the two types of lived experience are whether one has a personal lived experience with mental health conditions or experience as of a person's circle of support. Lived experience, self-awareness, and innate interpersonal communication skills. The formal objectives of trainings are to share knowledge and develop skills, but the reality is that each participant contributes to the learning and development process in a very personal and insightful manner. Lived experience is the recollection of and insights gained from each participant's experience and recovery path that will enhance their understanding of the concepts being presented. Self-awareness is where participants will enter training with a certain degree of awareness of their personal stressors, resilient strategies, areas of strengths, and areas still requiring attention. Innate interpersonal communication skills is where interacting and supporting others is a normal social function. Participants will likely have already been in, a, in support of relationships and have discovered an innate ability and a strong desire to help others. Recognizing the gifts that each participant brings will encourage opportunity, promotes mutual benefit and authentic support. To speak and truly understand the relevance of the material, not only should a strong training facilitator have excellent training skills and a strong ability ability to facilitate group learning, lived experience with a mental health condition and recovery should also be represented. represented. Very important to have the lived experience. Here's a quote by Teresa Glaxton. For me, a key principle of peer support means working from a position of choice and therefore respecting the choices each individual makes. It is a principle of peer support to encourage self-determination and respect the fact that people will make their own choices whether or not I, as their peer support worker, agree or would choose the same for myself. And the quotes that you're going to see from this point on are from members of the peer leadership group. Diana Capone says, you cannot truly empathize with the recovery process by only studying or reading about it. The same way that you cannot truly empathize with the impact of hopelessness unless you have lived it. The following are suggested topics to be included in a peer support training. These themes and topics correspond to the skills, abilities, and personal attributes of a peer supporter as outlined in the guidelines, which we looked at earlier. A discussion of how fundamental principles such as the gift of lived experience, the power of hope, the concept of recovery, and the value of self-determination set the stage for the remainder of the peer support topics. An understanding of peer support values and ethics and the range of settings in which peer support can take place also enhance a prospective peer supporter's understanding of their role. Peer support happens in the context of human relationships where each person brings the impact of their life experience. This lived experience might include discrimination, stigma, social exclusion, poverty, trauma, and more. A peer supporter who understands the broader social and historical context of these experiences grasps, grasps their potential impact and will be better prepared to support others. Peer support relies on interpersonal communication, 
building trust within relationships and supporting another person as they choose to take steps towards change and recovery. Peer supporters often have an innate ability to do this, but these skills can be enhanced through sharing knowledge and learning through experience. Other areas of importance include negotiating limits and boundaries within a peer relationship, collaborating with community resources, and building resilience through self-care. Resilience and self-care are equally important for the peer supporter to foster their own wellness as they do this important work. And that goes across the board as well with all professions. Wendy Mishkin, one of the co-authors of the guidelines says, peer support is not scripted. It does not follow steps. It is about relationship. It comes from the heart through insight and knowledge gained from experience. So now we're going to look at the individual topics that we just went over, the fundamental principles. Hope, recovery, and credibility comes with a common lived experience and are distinguishing characteristics of peer support. A peer supporter mirrors a hope-filled vision of future possibilities and can inspire the peer to take steps towards recovery. Self-determination is an individual's right to determine their own fate, including courses of action, treatments, and supports. This principle requires the peer supporter to ensure that the peer's choice is honored while working together with the peer to explore options. Acting in an ethical and honorable manner helps a peer supporter to create and maintain a safe, trusting, and effective peer support relationship. A peer supporter who understands the impacts of trauma and uses trauma-informed practices will be less likely to unintentionally, unintentionally re-traumatize a peer and more likely to support healing. Providing a safe opportunity for a peer to talk about what happened to them rather than what is wrong with them, if they choose to do so, can be validating and healing for the peer. It can also help to ensure that causes of psychological distress are not overlooked. Peer support occurs in a wide range of environments. However, the underlying philosophy and practice of peer support is the same even though each environment presents its own opportunities and challenges. Learning more about the environment in which they will be working will help a peer supporter be, be better prepared. And here's a quote by Shana. When in a supportive relationship with my peers, I find it valuable both for myself and for those who I am supporting to recognize the various experiences they bring to the table and validate their struggles with realities such as poverty and systemic racism. Social and historical contexts. The philosophy of peer sport and its values of hope, self-determination and recovery were in part a response to the historic prevalence of social injustice and stigma towards those with mental health conditions. Understanding the historical context can help to explain challenging issues such as why some may be reluctant to disclose their illness and or seek support. Dealing with prejudice, discrimination and stigma, in addition to the challenges of ill health, makes recovery more difficult. Understanding the origins of stigma and being able to support peers as they deal with it will have a positive impact on recovery. Social exclusion can be a barrier to recovery. Participation in community life can have a positive impact on recovery. Honoring diversity and cultural differences strengthens a peer relationship and an important part of the peer relationship is supporting the peer as they build their community life. A lack of understanding of these concepts may result in barriers in the peer relationship. The holistic approach to health and well-being implicit to recovery requires an awareness of the social factors that can determine one's health. Peer supporters require knowledge and resources to support their peers to overcome challenges they may have in these areas.
Here's a quote by Eugene. An awareness of the historical context of mental illness serves as a foundation for understanding the legacy of oppression and discrimination out of which current trends in peer support developed. Interpersonal communication is basic to all human interactions. Good communication skills foster key components of peer support, such as trust, self-determination, and recovery, and are an important factor in building relationships. Communication skills are an area of expertise that can be developed and improved through training and practice. A successful peer support re relationship will leave the peer feeling more empowered and hopeful about the future. The value of the relationship is derived from a sense of connection to the shared experience of living with a mental health condition or being a loved one of someone who does. The message, quote, I've been there and found my way and I believe you can too, end of quote, or, quote, like you, someone I love has challenges with their mental health end of quote, embodies this concept. The process of recovery doesn't follow a straight line and involves personal growth and risk taking as steps are taken towards every increasing wellness. This process begins with hope for the future and a belief that something new and different is possible. The peer supporter plays a role in inspiring hope, fostering empowerment, and encouraging personal growth through change and adaptation. Building resilience, maintaining wellness, and planning ahead for crisis situations is important for those who have dealt with their own or their loved one's mental health conditions. Learning more about resilience and self-care will help peer supporters to maintain their own health while working in potentially stressful situations, and also enhance their ability to explore with others what is most suitable and effective for them. Peer supporters need to assess and manage personal and role-oriented limitations and boundaries. These may be explicit, as in a code of conduct or workplace protocol. They may be implicit, such as unwritten rules, possibly in relation to other care providers or the environment, or interpersonal in nature in relation to the peer being supported. Some of these boundaries may not be flexible, such as in a code of conduct, but others will be assessed as each situation arises. The term crisis may be used to describe a wide range of situations with respect to severity. The similarity throughout is that the peer perceives the situation to be, to be beyond their ability to cope. The role of a peer supporter includes understanding the situation, appreciating the perception of the peer, recognizing the severity of the problem, and responding in an appropriate manner. A well-prepared peer supporter will enhance their ability to support peers by maintaining a list of local community resources that a peer might use and, over time, will develop collaborative relationships with people within these local services. The folk the focus of peer supporters is always on recovery, holistic health, and the peer's self-described experience. However, background knowledge of the general range of possible symptoms and side effects to ill health and medication will provide a peer supporter with an awareness of potential issues that may arise. The symptoms should not be associated with specific illnesses or side effects related to specific drugs. Rather, it is the awareness of the range of experience that might occur that is important. And here's a quote by Karen Liberman. To support your peer is more than to listen and to talk. It's more than effective questioning. It's more than sharing your story. Those are mechanics. To be truly present is to communicate in a whole new way. It's as if each time, with each conversation, you're hearing the story for the first time. And it's the most important story you've ever heard. The connection is made, not with the ears, not with the tongue, not even with the brain. The connection is made with the heart. Powerful words by Karen. 
Are there any comments or questions before we move on to training methods? This is a question from Abby a little bit earlier about supervision. Do, do the guidelines speak at all to uh, best practices in peer supervision? No, they don't. No, no, they don't. In other settings, aren't they you're familiar with our peer supporters supervised? Yes, in all settings that I'm familiar with, peer supporters are supervised. Usually the coordinator is hired, a person with lived experience is hired and supervised. And there's also a connection with a professional from the mental health team, usually an occupational therapist is the contract supervisor. Most peer support workers, or a high majority of them, are contracted workers here on the West Coast. Okay. Training methods. The transition of knowledge into skill is embraced through experiential learning that includes opportunities, opportunities to practice such as role playing. This participatory approach to training in which learners are directly engaged in their own learning is more empowering and has the best results with adults. This means there is less in the way of lecture and more experiential activities such as interactive discussion, small group ex exercises, individual reflection and journaling, role playing, and learning from demonstrations of role play scenarios. These varied activities also accommodate participants' different learning styles. So passive learning is about reading, hearing words, and seeing pictures or graphics. And active learning is about seeing and hearing a demonstration, saying, as in taking part in a discussion or giving a talk, and doing, as in taking part in a role play. In other words, doing it for real. Con continued development of skills occurs through practice in real life situations. Here's a quote by Stéphane Grenier. He was the lead consultant for the Mental Health Peer Project. And he says, peer support, as clearly stated throughout these guidelines, is not intended to replace clinical programs but was established as a complement to traditional care. Considering the potential return on investment resulting from these initiatives, it makes sense for Canada to pay particular attention to peer support as it continues to improve mental health services and programs. Got to amen to that one? <laughs> I'm sure I do. So there are many paths that a prospective peer supporter may take towards becoming fully prepared, but it is expected that acquiring the knowledge specified within these two sets of guidelines, coupled with an opportunity to further develop these skills in a practice setting, will be a part of their preparation for the role of peer supporter and a fulfilling life of supporting others. National recognition of these guidelines is a first step in the process of growing respect for and accessibility to peer support, and that conclu concludes my webinar. Yay. <laughs> so we know we hear some clapping, and I guess we just welcome some questions if anybody has some questions, but in the meantime, Let's say a big, big thanks to Deb. She is clearly such a knowledgeable soul and is intimately familiar with, with the guidelines. So what a treat to have you with us here, Deb, today. Um, I'm, really, I'm really impressed and grateful for your depth and your breadth of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. I see the comments. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right on. <laughs> So excellent question about supervision. Thank you. I hope that that uh, we give you a, uh, an accurate answer. Um, but if there are any other any other questions, or if we call it a day, that's that's absolutely perfect. I'm rambling here to see if uh, any additional questions come in. Um, I see some people are still typing. And here's where to find the guidelines. And you can print them off or you can write in and ask for a hard copy. If you get a hard copy, it's pretty blue like that. If it printed off on your black and white computer, <laughs> it's great. So we get lots of feedback about your wealth of knowledge as well. 
Thank you for that, Michael. Appreciate that. Um, oopsies. Confidentiality was breached by the professional and not the peer supporter. If our peers had chosen, we likely could have had a nurse fired. So maybe wow. there's a bit more detail there, Sharon. So I'm just going to scroll up a little bit. So just bear with me. Um, this silly little thing never work when you want it. Oh, Lordy. I think I'm missing a little bit of information there, Sharon. Maybe there was more info. Uh, maybe there was an early earlier post, but I don't know, Deb. If you want to speak a little bit to confidentiality, um, I think Sharon, what you're saying is that the peer supporter has more skill level in confidentiality, and therefore the example you gave is that confidentiality was breached by professional staff, not a peer supporter, and so that is indicative of a well-trained peer supporter. Mm -hmm. We all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it looks like there are only, uh, wonder whether any clients uh, chosen their own peer to be trained as a supporter. Oh, chosen their own peer. Oh, so maybe somebody in the community and chose them to be mm -hmm. a peer. That's a That's an interesting question. Actually, I have heard of a situation of that where a client was seeing a peer supporter and the client actually was opposite. The peer supporter saw potential in the client and the client ended up becoming a peer supporter. And I've seen that in quite a few cases, actually. So Sharon just adds a little bit more detail. They read a peer supporter's file to see who her physician was and they could contact him and report what uh, what they saw was mania. Yeah. So we all, just a warning to us all, you all need to be careful with confidentiality and respecting the individuals. My rule of thumb is um, treat others as I'd want to be treated. So would I want somebody to do that to me? No, then I'm not gonna look in that file, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So it looks like we've come to conclusion with the typing. I think you've heard, Debbie, that many people are really grateful for your expertise today. So please leave us with a big heart to say thank you. We're very appreciative. Um, you know what we're really trying to do, as we know, is is highlight some of the best practices, and of course, peer involvement is something that we're we like to advocate for and support. And so having somebody like yourself with this wealth of experience and knowledge is, is, is really helpful to help us become more familiar with the information and help us then advocate for more peer involvement. So really appreciate you uh, being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. You guys are great. Thanks for your participation. Appreciate it. So maybe with that, we'll just say, please keep in touch with the website. Um, yes, thanks please, to Regina and that as well. Oh, uh, please have a look for further information. Again, if you have anything that you'd like to speak to us about uh, potential um, presentations, uh, often, you know, issues emerge in practice and they're new. We may or may not be familiar with it. So if there are some new things on your radar that you wish us to focus a little bit more on, shoot us an email, let us know. Uh, or maybe there are things you wish to speak about. So we are here to um, support our community. You're our community. We need to hear from you. Thank you kindly. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you much.